Okay, welcome everyone to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Speaker Series. We meet every Monday of the academic year in this room at this time. There's a sign-in sheet going around. If you haven't signed it yet, please do. That helps us keep track um, of who's here for our sponsors. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'm just going to give you a, um, a brief preview of what's coming up in the next few weeks. So uh, next Monday, April 29th, Katie Starkweather is coming from the University of New Mexico. Her talk is entitled, Why Risk It? Health Outcomes of Show to Bar uh, Women's Work. And the following week, May 6th, Lee Gettler is coming from the University of Notre Dame. And his talk is entitled, The Biology of Fatherhood in Context, Evolutionary Origins, Cross-Cultural Perspectives, and Implications for Men's Health. So that's what's coming up. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce this week, uh, Hazel Byrne, who's um, here at UCLA at the Institute for Society and Genetics. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about my research on um, the TT monkeys, and primarily on their evolutionary history, um, with, with um, implications for other factors in their biology. And um, I did most of this research during my PhD, and some of it has come afterwards, and then some of it has been developing since. Um, obviously, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Some of the stuff I talk about is is kind of uh, some of the methods are maybe not all that common, but I didn't want to talk about the methods and like go into that side. But if you guys want to know or anything isn't clear, please let me know. Um, I want to give a tiny bit of context into my own background, because although I cross a bit over into biological anthropology, my background is primarily much more animal science focused. Um, I did a four-year undergraduate zoology degree in Trinity College in the University of Dublin. And then I went on to do an evolutionary biology PhD at the University of, Manchester, or University of Salford in Manchester under the primatologist Professor John Bubley, um, which is where I began my research on TT monkeys, but I very much came from an animal science background. Um, Straight after my PhD, I came here to work with Jessica Lynch Alfaro in um, the Institute for Society and Genetics as a postdoc employee, and I've been here for almost two, two years now working with Jessica. Um, so I still do a lot of research on TTs, but my research at UCLA has been focused on taking a genomics approach to understand the evolutionary trajectory, trajectory of capuchin monkeys. monkeys. Um, they share many convergent traits with great apes, so we're not going to talk about this today, unfortunately, but um, we aren't far enough in our research to, to cover a talk. But, um, so I guess overall the essence of my research could be summarized as um, a merger between a traditional zoology background and modern evolutionary genetics, but with a focus on primates. Um, so rather than just studying one aspect of TT monkey biology, I try to understand the many biological factors that contribute to their diversity um, that make TT monkeys unique, and then combine this information together into kind of a whole systems approach um, to learn as much as I can about the evolution of these animals, um, and then use this information to also inform their taxonomy and inform their, their conservation. Um, so... This first slide is a picture of a coppery TT, a really beautiful coppery TT. Um, it is called Plectorocebus cuprius. Um, putting aside scientific rhetoric for a brief moment, I'm completely in love with these primates. Um, I can't get enough of them, and I want to spread that passion to as many people as possible because they're super understudied, and there's so many areas that we need to work on these primates in pretty much every area you can think of. They're, they're somewhat understudied. Um, I'm sure there's many people in this room that might not have heard much about them or have heard about them beyond their name or their scientific name, and that's uh, uncomfortably normal, to be honest. Um, so in comparison to other primates, like the pygmy marmoset, which probably everyone has heard of, um, pictured here, even squirrel monkeys, capuchin monkeys, or the spider monkey, such as this one that I took a photo of, a Tycross zoo. Um, with, these guys are very typically seen in zoos. They're typically featured in scientific, pop, popular science media and various different types of, of science. Um, TT monkeys are seen much less frequently. They're in the herd of and appreciated much less frequently. Um, they're rarely seen in zoos, and when we do see them, they probably don't grab your attention so much because of various aspects of their behavior. Um, and they're among the most understudied of all anthropoid primate lineages, at the same time as being some of the most species rich. So um, there's so much left for us to, to learn about them. Um, so let me give a brief introduction to TT monkeys and some of the things that make them so interesting to me. Um, TTs belong to the neotropical primate family Patacidae, which also includes Sakis, bearded Sakis, and Wakaris. Um, Patacidae is the earliest diverging extant lineage of neuroprimates. 
and they diverged from all other neotropical primates around 20 to 25 million years ago. Um, TT monkeys form the subfamily Calisabinae, um, which is sister to Pithecinae, the other, the Sakis wakaris and bearded, bearded Sakis. Um, and they diverged from, from Pithecines about 17 to 20 million years ago. So TT monkeys and Pithecines are representatives of some of the oldest extant groups, or the oldest extant groups of neotropical primates. So I'm going to just do a summary on their be behaviors. Um, TTs are small to medium-sized sexually monomorphic primates, which show a number of interesting behaviors. Um, they're shy, elusive primates. They're rarely seen on the ground, and they're not typically very curious, like you might expect, especially from, from a lot of primates we see in zoos. Um, their behaviors are like, some of these behaviors are like related to the threat of natural predation. So they're predated upon by diurnal pred raptors in their, um, in their natural habitats, as well as some small phthalates. TTs have a very complex so vocal behavior comprised of high and low pitched squeaks, trills, chirps, and grunts, much of which is related to their alarm calls. So for example, they're taught to have specific types of alarm calls um, for, uh, related to different predators. So if there's raptors or if there's small phthalates, and related to the location of these predators, whether they're in the ground or in the air and so on. And it's thought that their conspecifics can tell the type and location of the predator from the first few calls in their alarm sequence. DTs are taught to be the first neotropical primates that are found to show signs of primitive syntax. And this suggested that simple synthetic rules may have preceded the split between old world and neotropical primates. They're among less than 5% of the world's animals that form monogamous pairs. And even more unusual is that they're typically life, is their typical lifelong um, strongly bonded monogamous pairings. So they don't just pair off, they pair off for life. They live in small family-based groups that are made up of a breeding pair and their offspring. And which, these groups are founded upon the extreme pair bond of the mated adults. TTs are characterized by several interesting behaviors that were related to their social mon monogamy. Um, one of these is the extensive paternal care investment. So social monogamy is often associated with paternal care, but the case with TTs is rather exceptional. Um, the father is the primary caregiver for the in in infant. It primarily carries the infant. And most of the mother's interactions with the infant are just for nursing, and then it goes back to the father. Um, research has shown that they show a stronger pituitary adrenal stress response when they're separated from their fathers than when they're separated from their mothers. And also that the both pairs, both the father and the mother, show a stronger stress response when they're separated from each other than when they're separated from their baby. So they're more bonded to each other than their offspring. So adult pairs or family groups sit together with their tails entwined as a form of social bonding. This is an affiliative behavior that's also incredibly cute. <laughs> um, Another aspect of their com complex vocal behavior includes the antiphonal duet call of the pair bonded adults, which are employed to defend their territories as well as reinforce their bond. We see similar behaviors in socially monogamous species of gibbons. Um, I want to see if we can listen to this, this clip of their... I don't know if you guys can hear that very well. Okay, so that's a duet, male and female, um, and it's, it, there's so much going on there. They, uh, okay, so um, just very briefly, they're a developing um, model for um, social monogamy or a social bonding and monogamy, and Professor Karen Bale is at um, UC Davis and her, her team at the California National Primate Center research TTs a lot for this purpose. So TTs likely provide a more appropriate model for making inferences about social bonding in humans than the commonly used uh, uh, rodent models. So pictured here is a neurobiological model of the male TT pair bond formation. Um, in a recent study by Karen Bales and her team, um, a jealousy condition was in induced in male TTs by placing them in front of their female partner with a stranger male. And brain scans showed heightened activity in an area associated with social pain in humans, which is the cingulate cortex, and with pair bond formation in primates, which is the lateral septum. Um, OK, so they're typically predominantly, predominantly generalist frugivores who also eat um, some leaves, some insects, other invertebrates, and birds' eggs. 
Um, they're known to eat over 100 different types of fruit and plants, so they're quite generalist, they're not very specific, and they've relatively short canines which are adaptive for eating this type of vegetation and fruits. The data we have available for TTs is from only a small amount of species and a very small amount of representative studies, some of which are extremely old and we don't really necessarily even know which species they're talking about. Um, but we know there is significant variation between some of the lineages, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but it's probably underestimated because so little has been done on them. Some species in eastern Brazil also eat soil, which is a behavior known as geophagy, um, which is likely um, to aid in the absorption of plant toxins from some of the plants they eat in that biome. Um, I have a tiny, also a tiny video here of a brown tea tea eating some fruit. It was um, rescued. I'm not exactly sure of the circumstances, but I wanted, if you haven't seen, oh, oopsies, if you haven't seen them before, I thought it was a nice little video to show you what they're like. They're quite small, like cat size and kind of dainty, dainty little creatures. I love this little guy. He's so adorable. He's really eagerly eating his fruit too. Okay. And a few. Right. Um, so I'm going to touch on this a lot later, so I'm just going to give a very brief summary. Um, they occur exclusively in humid tropical and subtropical forests in South America. But they have an extensive range from the uh, foothills of the Andes through the tropical forests of the Orinoco and Amazon basins. Um, through the, they, then they go on to the Chaco forests of Bolivia and Paraguay, and then onto the Atlantic forests of eastern Brazil. Um, so very briefly, I'm going to have a look at their taxonomic history because it's relevant to my work, but I'm not going to get into the messy aspects, which is probably most of their taxon taxonomic history. Um, so for most of their history, they are considered monogeneric. Um, the genus Calicebus was proposed for TTs by Thomas in 1903. Um, they have many early contributions to their taxonomy. And they all list various numbers of species um, with varying views on species validity and ranking. Um, there was three major reviews by Philip Hershkovitz in 1963, 1988, and 1990, and all subsequent classifications are, are based on primarily on, on Hershkovitz's work. Um, he, he looked at over 1,200 museum specimens, recognized 25 taxa across 13 species, and he separated them into four species groups um, based on similar, primarily on pelage coloration and geographic distribution. Um, Subsequently, Kobayashi carried out a morphometric analysis of craniodental measurements. Um, he assigned species to five spe or TTs to five species groups that differed slightly from Hershkovitz gr Hershkovitz's groups. As other characters such as pelage, col pelage coloration, karyotype, distribution were consistent with his classification, Kobayashi argued that these were represented phylogenetically independent clades. These groups were the um, Torquatus group, Personatus group, Donacophilus group, Moloch group, and Cuprius group in that order. Those five faces represent them. Um, the next major contribution was by Randrus Mellon et al. in 2002, and he raised all, species, all taxa to, sub, to species level. So we had no subspecies anymore, and everything was recognized as a species. And since that time, this was also suggested by Colin Groves. Since that time, between 2002 and 2015, we had five new species descriptions, one resurrected species. So when I published my first research for my PhD, there was 34 recognized species of TT monkeys. So TT show a really incredible range of phenotypic diversity. They're one of the most species-rich groups of primates, and pelage coloration, along with distributional evidence, have been the primary diagnostic traits um, for species description and identification and delineation. However, in spite of the great variation we see in pelage coloration and the great number of species described as a result, traditional taxonomic characters, uh, skeletal characters, cranial and postcranial skeletal characters, suggested that there was little deep diversity within TTs. They were all very, pretty similar along, uh, when we looked at these characters alone. They showed only small amounts of variation in skeletal characters, and they were assumed to represent a group of quite closely related uh, primates. Although there was evident skeletal variation with sufficient variation for Kobayashi to erect species groups based on the cranial morphometrics, um, the general consensus seemed to be that, that TTs began diversifying in the Pliocene, Pleistocene type, type era. And they're also behaviorally conservative in, conservative in some ways. All of them show social, are taught to show social monogamy. All of them are taught to show heavy paternal care investment and so on. However, in addition to pelage coloration, their broad distribution with species groups showing uh, species groups occupying distinct biomes, differences in ecology, 
body size, and extreme karyotypic diversity, um, which are seen across the species groups, these suggested that TTs could actually possibly represent a morphologically conservative radiation with deeper divergences than expected if, than, when we solely looked at skeletal characters. So now you're a little bit familiar with TTs. I want to discuss where we were when I started my PhD in 2013, what we knew of the diversity of these primates. We were 10 to 15 years at least behind our understanding of old world primate lineages. TTs, and TTs were among the least studied of all neotropical lineages, even though the whole group is pretty understudied. At a time when we were studying old world primates using evolutionary, using whole genomes, when we pass entirely through the evolutionary genetics era into the evolutionary genomics era, we still knew next to nothing about the species relationships, genetic diversity, and evolutionary history of many neotropical primates. Molecular studies were limited to some higher level primate phylogenies, such as those by Perlman and Springer, but they don't provide a very adequate or detailed understanding of the evolutionary history in diverse groups. For instance, with TTs, they contained only a handful of species, um, and which was further confounded, confounded by the use of captive, incorrectly identified, and putatively hybridized specimens. Prior to my PhD research, Kobayashi's 20-year-old morphometric-based phylogeny was still the only species-level phylogeny available for TTs. There was no molecular genetic investigation at all that focused on TT monkeys. Okay, so the first study from, published in my PhD begins to address this positive of information. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'm going to be discussing this article that was published in 2016. Um, the major objectives of this first study were to investigate evolutionary history and genetic diversity, infer the phylogenetic relationships and divergence times among the species and the species groups. It was well over a decade since the most recent comprehensive taxonomic reviews, and no proposal had ever been evaluated using molecular evidence. So we wanted to test taxonomic proposals using DNA sequence data for the first time and evaluate the current taxonomy in light of all available evidence. We are interested in assessing whether Kobayashi species groups were, were monophyletic um, and actually formed phylogenetically independent clades, as he has suggested. <laughs> that term is funny, but... Um, species classification is focused heavily on pelage coloration, but there's also quite a lot of variation within each species, such that sometimes it's hard to decide which one goes where and how to actually define how to diagnose every single taxon. So we wanted to um, assess monophylia species that were defined based on this pelage coloration. Um, and we aim to address the assumption prior to this work that TTs were morphologically similar because they diverged somewhat recently. Um, we wanted to test the somewhat homogenized view of TT diversity that was brought about in the assumption that lower variation in skeletal characters correlated with genetic diversity. Could it be instead that um, they occupied a relatively generalized and conserved area of morphospace over a longer geological period than expected? And were there some were there lineages that were old but morphologically conservative? And did the current species group based ta taxonomy adequately represent the hierarchy and the depth of diversity found across TT monkeys? So just very briefly, I'm going to keep the methods quite brief. I want to give some context about the amount of data we generate for this study using traditional Sanger sequencing approaches. Um, we collected fresh tissue samples from 59 well-caught voucher specimens representing 15 known species, some unknown species, and many divergent lineages within these species. Um, most of these specimens were collected by my PhD supervisor and his colleagues over decades of work in the context of an Amazonian-wide in faunal inventory project. We included multiple well-caught specimens from most of species, and most of these were uh, they're all of known provenance and known identification. So we knew what we were dealing with before we started to do genetics. Our samples also included representatives from each of Kobayashi's species groups. We obtained DNA from 22 lo loci, 20 nuclear, 2 mitochondrial. Our nuclear loci were based off um, Perlman's higher level phylogeny. We just used the same primers they use, so it was pretty straightforward. We obtained nearly 1,000 DNA, nucle DNA, nuclear and mitochondrial DNA sequences and obtained over 200 from GenBank that were uh, generated for Perlman's study. We concatenated the alignments and we made three different data sets, nuclear, a mitochondrial, and then a combined data set. And our data sets were pretty, pretty, um, pretty full. We had over an average of 90% coverage um, across our data sets. Okay. We used Partition Finder to uh, look at the optimal number of models because we had so many different loci, we couldn't give them all an independent model. Um, we 
uh, conducted file of the genetic inference through maximal likelihood and Bayesian methods, pretty standard methods, um, and jointly estimated phylogeny and diversification times under uncorrelated log normal relaxed clock in BEAST. Um, we included five other neotropical primate lineages in order to include fossil calibrations. Um, so we included some uh, 7A, a Cimerinae, and three, three, three Patessinae species. I designed two calibration points um, to be implemented based on the with minimum bounds, hard minimum bounds based on the fossils Prothera pythesia, which is an extinct Patessinae genus, and Neocimeri, which is an extinct Cimerinae genus. For both points, I used maximum soft maximum bounds of 26 million years, such that 95% of the prior distribution fell before this age. This was based on several lines of evidence, for example, that the Miocene Patagonian fossils belong to independent stem radiations and the lack of the complete absence of fossils for extant lineages from South American formations from this period. So all lines of evidence suggested that by that neotropical primates, extant neotropical primates began diverging after 26 million years. So briefly on to our results. So all analysis across all data sets you did yielded an identical topology for all species groups with strongly significant support. We found that TTs diverged from the sister clade around 19 million years ago, which was consistent with other estimates based on higher level phylogenies. And we also found very old divergences among TT monkeys themselves. So the species group that we call referred to Torquatus was the earliest diverging lineage, and it split from all other TTs around 10 to 11 million years ago in the late Miocene. Next to diverge was the Eastern Brazil Personatus group, which um, diverged around 8 to 9 million years ago, and then we found a, a Pliocene divergence between the Donacophilus and Moloch species groups. Um, in the other tree studies, I'll discuss it briefly today, some based on entirely independent and large genome-wide data sets, we found same, same results, same topology, and really similar uh, age estimates, so they've remained pretty consistent. Um, for context, what we revealed was that extant TTs began diversifying around the same time as the great apes. Um, and uh, the Turquat species group, for example, was around as old as the orangutan genus. The only major conflict with the morphological hypothesis of Kobayashi was that the Moloch and Cuprius groups that he proposed were not monophyletic. Um, we included all Cuprius group species in the Moloch group, and we recommended that the Cuprius group was abolished entirely. Um, so analysis confirmed that TT monkeys were divided into three morphologically conservative but deeply divergent lineages of Miocene origin. And these corresponded to Kobayashi's Turquatus, Personatus groups, and then a group containing Danicophilus, Moloch, and his now abolished Cuprius group. Based on the fact that these clades were first hypothesized through cranial morphometrics, and they were supported by independent cardiological, ecological, and biogeographic evidence, which I'll discuss a bit more shortly, we suggested that TT monkeys should be divided into tree genera that were better representative of the great molecular and underappreciated diversity represented in these groups. I'm going to just briefly introduce the genera, so just really quickly in these slides. Um, Carasibus was the new genus that we identified for the Turquatus species group. The name refers to the explorer Humboldt account, so that missionaries called it the widow TT based on its pelage coloration, which was reminiscent to them of a white veil, neckerchief, and gloves of a widow in mourning. Um, there are six species, and they occur in the Amazon and Orinoco basins in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. The second genus is Calcibus. So the eastern Brazil uh, TTs um, of the Personatus group retained the name Calcibus because Personatus was the type species chosen by Thomas. The five species are endemic to Brazil. They're found in the Atlantic forest biome of eastern Brazil. And Barbara Brown hay is also found in the uh, forest patches in the Kachinga. Um, they occur in the most developed and populous region of Brazil. And all species, the entire clade, are threatened with extinction. Um, for Plectorocebus, there's a new genus for members of the Donacophilus and the Moloch groups. The name Plectorocebus refers to the affiliative tail twinning behavior that I mentioned earlier. Um, over 20 species across two divergent species groups that diverge in the Pleistocene, or the Pliocene, excuse me. Um, the Donacophilus group species have the most disjunct set of species distributions, um, and their geographic range is unusual among neotropical primates. They occupy forest patches and gallery forests in um, savanna floodplains of Bolivia, Paraguay, and Brazil, with the range of Palisans, the Pale One, extending into the Chaco scrublands and the Pantanal swamps. 
six, they contain six species and they're the most understudied co uh, collectively of all TT species all TT species, we still to this day only have genetic evidence for one species, which is Don the Donacophilus, um, Tectoricebus donacophilus, um, because it exists in zoos, actually, in the United States. Um, and the vocal evidence, which I'll mention a bit later, suggests that Oenanth may belong to it, its, own, its own lineage outside of this group entirely, and Urimbubensis likely actually belongs in the Moloch group rather than this group altogether. So this might not even be a real, a real clade. So for species, we didn't have molecular data. We just kind of followed what had been suggested based on cranial morphometrics priorly and what all the rest of the other evidence kind of combined. So the Amazonian Moloch group contains at least 16 species. It's over half of the recognized species of TT. They're phenotypically diverse, and the vast number of new species described um, in the past decades have been from this group. They're also the most widespread. They occur throughout the southern and western Amazon base, basin east of the Andes, through Brazil, Peru, and into uh, Bolivia and Colombia. Okay, so again, I kind of mentioned where they live, but I just wanted to give a visual perspective of it. So, Carasibis are, are um, so Calasibis are in the red section in the east, and they're separated from all other TTs by the Cejado biome, um, which is a dry, open habitat where we don't find any TT monkeys. Um, Carasibis are in the Amazon and Orinoco basins up in the northwest, and their overlap with Plectorasibis, where they're sympatric, is, is in Cyan. Um, the Donacophilus group occurs in this bottom region and in the little tip of the, of the Amazon basin. And the Moloch group occurs through the rest of the dark blue region and in the, in the Cyan region also. So the groups proposed by Gobayashi using cranial dental morphometrics corresponds well with what we found primarily in, in, in our molecular results. He noted specifically that Carasibis and Calasibis, or in his terms, Torquatus group and the Personatus group, represented the highest, a high degree of character differentiation, while the other groups, um, which form Plectorasibis, were more closely related. A postcranial diagnostic character that distinguishes the genus Carasibis is the presence of the entepicondylar foramen in the humerus, and this is absent in other TTs. We have body size and pelage coloration also support a division. For example, you can see quite clearly here, Carasipa species are mostly blackish or reddish, and they, have, they all have a contrasting whitish throat collar. And the Moloch species group of Plectorasibus is medium-sized, typical-looking TTs um, that are gray to brown in the dorsum, and in, uh, eventually they are either white, red, orange, typically, although there's two exceptions to that rule. The Donacophilus clade are the smallest species, they generally show a buffy to grayish pelage coloration, um, and they lack strong contrast in their pelage. And then the Atlantic Forest or the Eastern Brazil Calasibis have a shaggy pelage type. They're overall brown, brownish, grayish color, that it, and they're quite distinct um, visually from other pr primates, their pelage, even though it's hard to put that into words. They have a really extensive chirotypic variation in the, the subfamily, this subfamily. So Carasibis are characterized by low dip-like chromosome numbers. They have dip-like chromosome numbers of 16 to 22, the lowest known in any primate um, anthropoid, any primate lineage, in fact. Plectorasibis taxa have high chromosome numbers of 46 to 50, and Calasibis have somewhat intermediate to high of 42 to 44. We'll discuss ecological differences a little bit more in the biogeography part in a few minutes. Um, so I don't want to be too repetitive, but even sympatric Amazonian species that occur in the same forest show distinct habits, somewhat distinct habitat preferences. Um, although they're extremely understudied, the few studies available show that, di that they do show dietary differences. Although they're all generalist frugivores, some show uh, they, they supplement this diet with varying sources of other foods. So Carasibus consume more insects, more seeds, and more tougher fruits. And the diet of Pimolic group contain more leaves. And then, as I mentioned, Calasibis, um, they, the ones in eastern Brazil, they also eat soil. So in the end, it appeared to be somewhat a case of considerable diversity in many diagnostic characters that have been somewhat underappreciated because of their morphological conservatism, conservatism in skeletal characters. Um, 
We also provided the first insights into species level relationships and divergence times. I won't get into this too much because it probably doesn't interest really very many people. Um, but their data estimates for species divergences were very recent. So for the species, the Moloch group, they all diverged around one to two million years ago in the Pleistocene. So we have this timeline where we have these deep divergences in the late Miocene with very recent species level divergences in the Pleistocene. Um, although we had very strong resolution for most species relationships, the phylogenetic position of two species varied quite strongly in the combined, which is influenced by mitochondrial and the nuclear data sets. This is something I address more in later studies, and I'll touch on just very, very briefly. Um, so some of this, this study impacts. So at the time, not anymore, but at the time already, this study represented one of the largest molecular data sets for any group of platyrian primates and provided the first comprehensive review of the subfamily, molecular review of the subfamily Cali 7A. It illustrated the value of molecular evidence, particularly for morphologically conservative and understudy groups, and provides a basis for future studies on the evolutionary history and taxonomy of TT monkeys. We revealed that morphological conservatism did not correlate with genetic diversity, and TTs were much more genetically distinct than we expected based on skeletal characters. However, the genetic variation was largely consistent with species groups proposed by Kobayashi based on craniomorphometrics, so there was true but perhaps subtle differences in the shape and size of their skulls and dentition. It seems that TTs found success in a particular area of mor morphospace and a particular range of niches and behaviors over a long geological time. And they are perhaps the primate embody embodiment of the phrase, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. The new classification more accurately reflects TT monkey evolutionary history, the hierarchy of relationships among the TT clades, and the previously underappreciated genetic diversity represented by the TT monkey moniker. TTs are as comparatively genetically diverse as their sister clade, the Patessinae, which has long included tree genre, but this diversity is rarely recognized. This is visually exem exemplified on the front cover of a collection of research on the family Patessidae, which was published just in 2015, a year before our research. Um, there's only one TT monkey when re in reality, if it was to be fair, there should be tree just like there is of Patessinae. So a lack of insight into the great diversity found among TT monkeys has had implications well beyond just how we name them and how we classify them. However, there's been quite a lot of renewed research in recent years, and that's quite reassuring. Um, we've seen quite a broad adoption of this nomenclature already. I think there's over 50 citations on this article, and it's, kinda, it's already started to, to catch on. So amongst the other issues, this research also further highlighted just how little we know about TT monkeys. So existing information on their social systems, behaviors, their diet, their habitat preferences are all based on a really small number of representative studies and representative species. It seems that we underestimated their behavioral diversity to some degree because we assumed for so long that they're all members of this really closely related radiation rather than distinct lineages that went back to the Miocene. The trend was that if we studied the diet of one species or the monogamous behaviors or the parental care behaviors of one species, we could apply this information to all TT monkeys. Um, and, and we had this perception of them as a somewhat homogenized group. When we look into it, it might not be as true as we thought it was. So one final interesting point is founded in the supposed ubiquity of social monogamy across all TT taxa which is, if true, when we look into it further, suggests that ancestral calisabinae also form monogamous pairs. Our divergence time estimate highlight that this system has persevered in this subfamily for over 10 million years and perhaps much longer, a feat unrivaled in all other monogamous anthropoid primate lineages, making TTs a particularly interesting model for the study of social monogamy. Okay, so since this work, there's been various forms of research and whatever, but um, when another research group that I'm not connected to studied TT vocalizations in a comparative manner for the first time, and they found they fit quite well with the proposed taxonomy. So although the Eastern Brazil TTs of the genus Calicebus weren't included in this study, we found that Caricebus, the earliest diverging lineage, showed a very distinct vocalization pattern. This is their duet. Um, and then within from Plectorocebus species, which are the top, to rep, these are representatives of them in the top two. And within Plectorocebus, there were several highly distinct vocalization patterns that um, were concordant with the Moloch group species and with the Donacophilus group species. Um, 
so these are periodic vocal duets in Titi's. Caracibus lucifer is at the bottom, Plectoracebus discolor, a member of the Moloch group in the middle, Plectoracebus donocophilus, a member of the donocophilus group at the top. One of the major revelations in this study was for a TT species for which we had no molecular data whatsoever, and the San Martin TT, whereby we followed, we followed morphologically based assumptions that this belonged to the Donacophilus group. Um, the vocalization data showed that this species had a completely distinct vocalization pattern from both the Moloch group and the Donacophilus groups, and perhaps belongs in a distinct species group. Uh, which is a really interesting find, and perhaps we'll get some genetic data in the future that we can assess this with. It's particularly interesting considering this species is critically endangered, so it could rep be a sole representative of a unique lineage of TT monkeys. It also exists in, the, in a kind of unique part over in the Andean foothills in Peru that is quite detached from, from the rest of the Donacophilus group. Okay, and then this study, which was really amazing. So late last year, the Calisabine story became even more interesting when it was revealed using ancient DNA te techniques that, in contrast to morphological hypotheses, the extinct Jamaican primate, Xenotrix, was in fact a member of the subfamily Calisabine. It was an extinct genus of TT monkey. So insular Caribbean primates are morphologically extremely unusual. They display numerous derived traits, and Xenotrix was considered the most morphologically derived of all the insular Caribbean primates. Attempts to establish how these primates were related to fossil and extant platrines have been highly controversial and led to multiple conflicting hypotheses. Um, these range from close sister taxon relationships with various extant platine lin lineages to these being members of a stem platine lim lineage that fell ex outside extant neotropical primates. So using a complete mitochondrial genome and seven nuclear regions, Woods et al. demonstrated that Xenotrix is part of an existing platyrene radiation rather than a late surviving stem platyrene as kind of had been the, the maybe more, more um, supported hypotheses in spite of its unusual adaptations. Um, so they found that it fell within the species-rich but morphologically conservative radiation of the TT monkeys um, and, and actually, it fell as sister lineage to the widow TT genus that we described in 2016. So, in, despite the incredible morphological similarity between Caracebus, Calacebus, and Plectoracebus, the three extant TT genus G genre, widow TTs of the genus Caracebus were in fact more closely related to a morphologically distinct lineage found in the Caribbean islands. They used much of the sequence data from our 2016 study to generate the baits to amplify the nuclear regions from Xenotrix and also much of our sequence data in this phylogeny to show where it fell. It fell. Um, these results suggested that even morphologically conservative lineages can exhibit phonetic plasticity in environments like those found in islands. In addition, although I believe that their dates are, are quite inflated, um, they found that Xenotrix and Caracebus diverged from other TTs 15 million years ago, which is over 4 million years older than my, than my um, average estimates, um, and that these diverged from each other at around 11 million years ago. Um, primates have been present in the Caribbean since 18 million years ago, so these results implied that the Caribbean primates were likely um, generated from multiple overwater colonizations rather than being one, one single group of, of primates. Okay. So I'm going to go back to some of my own research. Um, so the next major piece of research was aimed at understanding the spatial temporal patterns of diversification in TT monkeys and at wondering what processes drove their diversification. For example, um, asking how we came to have tree extant genera and over 30 species from a single ancestral population in the Miocene. And how could our understanding of the evolution of the South American and Amazonian landscapes be interpreted in light of this evolution? So much of what we understand of the biogeography of the neotropics is, divide, is derived from studies of avian taxa. Um, the drivers of avian speciation in the neotropics have been typically related to vicarians owing to landscape change, including Andean uplift, the river formation, and the evolution of the PEBA system, um, or to lineage-specific dispersal ability, uh, abilities. So these are kind of competing hypotheses. Although avian taxa are important models, it's necessary to investigate diversification patterns across a range of neotropical fauna in order to get a, a broader synthesis of the historical biogeography of the neotropics. So um, neotropical primates are diverse and widespread, and among all neotropical primate lineages, TT monkeys are unrivaled in their distribution in space and time. 
They form one of the most widespread and species-rich groups, making them a particularly interesting model to assess um, historical biogeography of South America, in addition to me being interested in them themselves and how they diversified. Um, this is also supplemented by the fact that we now have an, a, a robust phylogenetic framework to our 2016 study. And their timeline of diversification is also interesting in that we have these Miocene divergences and then these Pleistocene divergences. Um, we, they also have an extensive range, so they're found across nearly all eco-geographic zones found in the Neotropics, with the exception of Mesoamerica. Um, and then we have each group showing distinct pa distributional patterns, as we discussed earlier. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to be discussing this article that we published last year in Zoologica Scripta. Um, our, our work was based on a statistical biogeographic approach, um, and we, we aim to reconstruct the biogeographic history of Cali 7 a we wanted to understand their pattern of diversification um, and determine the relative importance of various um, biogeographic models or in terms of or, uh, vicariance dispersal in shaping present day distributions. So we wanted to infer the geographic origin of the major clades, where the major, major clades originate, um, the history and mode of their colonization across South America. So how did those, those clades move from one ancestral population to being six, five species up to 16, 17 species like in Plectorocebus moloch? as well as understand the processes that drove that and this present day sympathy between Carocebus and Plectorocebus. So we have these sympatric taxa in the Amazon. In addition to understanding, oh, we wanted to interpret our results in light of the evolution of the South American landscape and then also in light of the things that drove TT monkey diversification. But in addition to understanding TT monkey diversity, these, this, this study could lend an insight and has broader implications for the insight of the biogeographic history of South America, the biotic connections between the Atlantic forest and the Amazon, and regarding speciation in the Amazon itself. Okay, so I'm going to summarize this really quickly. Um, we assemble a similar molecular data set to what we use in our other study, but we added sequence data for a few species that weren't in this study, um, and we added also, we also added sequence data for old world primates to add four more fossil calibration points to our phylogeny to make sure it was as robust as possible based on our data. Um, and we jointly estimated phylogeny and diversification times under an uncorrelated log normal relaxed clock in, be in beast. We divided the distribution of TT monkeys into eight geographic regions, encoded each taxon for presence or absence in each of these regions. They, the regions are defined based on major biomes or vertebrate areas of endemism in the Amazon. Um, we use the ore package Biogeo Bears to reconstruct the biogeographic history um, based on time calibrated trees, and we use 12 alternative models implemented in a likelihood framework. We, these models allowed a varying subsets of different biogeographic processes, so some allowed narrow sympathy, widespread sympathy, different types of vicariance. Some allowed this jump dispersal, and for reference, jump dispersal corresponds to a scenario where a new population is founded from a, a rare long distant colonization event, that is, that divergence and dispersal were, in, were coincident, they happened at the same time. Um, we impl also implemented distant dependent dispersal models where dispersal probability is impacted by distance, so how far they are. So we reconstructed phylogenetic relationships were largely resolved and they, they nearly all know it showed pretty good support. Um, it's similar to other analyses, probably the most notable result is this rapid diversification of the Moloch group into three major clades within about 200,000 years in the early Pleistocene. This topology was the same topology I got in, in other studies using um, genome-wide genome DDRAD uh, seq uh, data. Um, it's pretty much the same, exact same thing that we got in those studies. So um, this is quite a, a decently supported topology. Um, of the 12 Biogea Bears models that we evaluated, the two best fit models were highly similar. Both of these included jump dispersal and distance spent to dependent dispersal. Um, together, they comprise 95% of the relative likelihood, um, and the strong concordance between these models was quite strong support for the inferred biogeographic scenario. Um, numerous factors pointed to jump dispersal as a strong contributor to explaining the data. Oh, I'll leave that at that. Okay. So I first just want to say that um, different timescales have been proposed for the formation of the Amazonian drainage system. Um, 
Our results are con I considered most consistent with a recent uh, transition from Pliocene to Pleistocene, or Pleistocene to Pleistocene transition from floodplain to lowland forest. So um, in the Miocene, there was a huge PEBA system in this area of the Amazon. And um, it's still not entirely sure when the PEBA system disappeared and when the modern drainage system appeared. Um, and we, we interpret our, our results under a young Amazon model where it, this occurred in the Pliocene to Pleistocene time. Um, so our results suggested that prior to genus level divergences, we had a really widespread ancestral population from the northwestern Amazon through the savannas region, or the modern day savannas region, should I say, to the southwest, the southern Atlantic forest. Um, and then TTs were also absent from this part in our reconstruction. They're absent from Inambari, which is C up in, in the corner there, um, which relates to where the PEBA system would have occurred. Um, however, there are known land connections to the west of the PEBA system from the northwestern Amazon down to the savannas regions. And it's likely that they're at least intermittently connected, these populations, even if it wasn't completely continuous. Um, so the earliest divergence within the subfamily so Cali Sabine occurred at about 10 million years under this, this phylogeny. Um, I'm characterized by a vicariant event. So it, uh, something happened that div divided this widespread population. Um, and this is quite consistent with vicariants across stable, geolog uh, stable terra firm centers of the Andean foothills of the northwestern Amazon and um, the uh, terra firm centers of the Brilliant Brazilian Shield around here and then up around here. Um, so once the link around the southern rim, we, we talk, this is also coincides with a period of strong and widespread Andean uplift, and it also occurs along the Andes. So it's, it seems likely that this was, might have, may have been related to Andean uplift. Once the link around the southern rim of the Peba system disappeared, the Karasibis ancestor remained isolated in this region until the Pleistocene when the Peba system started to, to disappear. We note that the inferred biogeographic scenario is consistent with the recovery of Xenotrix as sister to Karasibis, although the dates are obviously quite different in our phylogeny. With, after Karasibis diverged, so after this point, then Xenotrix ancestor would have dispersed north or, or maybe around here um, and, and went up to um, Jamaica. Okay, so in terms of the remaining, um, so. The ancestor to these, these genera remained widespread for another million, two million years, and then another vicariant event split them. Um, all newer primate taxa that are found in the Atlantic forest have closely related sister taxa in the Amazon, and this is consistent with most avian, avian lineages as well. Um, based on these patterns in avian taxa, it's been suggested that um, there's been two major routes of connection between the Atlantic forest and the, uh, the Amazon. So most Miocene divergences seem to be collected um, along the Southern Sahado and uh, Mato Grosso and towards, towards the tra transition um, of the Chaco in Bolivia and Paraguay, while younger Pleistocene divergences um, seem to be connected through the Katinga and the, nor the Northeastern Amazon. Um, our, our reconstruction strongly suggests that TTs use this Miocene corridor, and it's quite, it's literally pretty much exactly what we recovered. Um, interestingly, plants in the Cerrado, Cerrado began to diversify around 9 million years ago, so it's quite possible that ecological changes in the development of the Cerrado biome, which is here, um, led to this divergence, because TTs don't live there now, and it's unlikely they can, they can exist in that kind of habitat, or at least as they are. Okay, so very quickly then we went from the Pictoracebus ancestor was here and then we had a jump dispersal event for Moloch into here. I'm not going to go into this big mess in detail. I just really want to say that um, we had a very kind of explosive species level diversification. So Caracebus, in the early Pleistocene, Caracebus was still refined to this area. And, and actually, it, at the very start, the P. Moloch group seemed to be confined maybe to this southern, this southern area. Um, they had seemed to have relatively restricted ranges. Um, and then from the early Pleistocene to around 0.5 million years ago, they just spread across the Amazon. Um, and we, I refer to this as a sequential long distance island hopping model of speciation. Our reconstruction suggested that all cladogenetic events were jump dispersal or occurred within the same area. So none of it was by vicariance or the splitting of populations. Um, so, and it, it somewhat explains the sympathy between Caracebus and Plectorosiva species in the Western Amazon, because um, they were likely uh, 
isolated at opposing extremes of the Amazon by the Peva system throughout the Miocene and into the early Pleistocene. And um, once the Peva system started to recede and these and lowland forests or lowland terra firm forests were established, the Moloch group could spread uh, westward and the Carasebus group could come eastwards. Okay. So um, over half of the species that are recognized are members of the Moloch group, whereas Carasebus only has six species. Yet they both live in the Amazon and they both began to diversify at a very similar time period. So we, we are curious about why this happened. Why is the Moloch group so diverse and why is the Car Carasebus so have only six species essentially? Um, so one of the major differences between these guys is that um, they have different, different uh, habitat preferences. And the thing that best explains their habitat preferences are uh, the structure of forest vegetation. So Carasebus species usually occur in forests that are tall and well stratified, mostly in undisturbed highland terra firm regions. Whereas Moloch group taxa are frequently found in poorly stratified low forests, including disturbed secondary and liana rich habitats and seasonally unindated regions. And they're often also found at the edge of large gaps in the canopy. We often find poorly stratified gallery forests in low-lying areas along waterways, such that rare dis jump dispersal events may occur more frequently in the Moloch group. So basically their habitat preference made it more likely that they would actually be the ones that would go across these major rivers. Additionally, they can thrive at edge and in disturbed habitats, which Carasebus can't. So they may have been able to disperse more broadly by using temporary or developing lowland forests, forests at the edge of the range and forests along the river network of the Amazon, whereas Carasebus likely depend upon the establishment of well-developed forests and of connectivity between those well-developed forests. Okay, so to summarize everything that we found in terms of what drove TT monkey diversification, the most frequently invoked hypothesis um, or biogeographic model for the Amazon basin is the riverine barrier hypothesis. And actually, it may be counter to its name. It, it, it suggests river dynamics as primarily responsible for the isolation and diversification of Amazonian biota. Diversification patterns across some avian taxa have been taken to suggest that the establishment of the Amazonian drainage system led to the division of formerly continuous copulations. That is, as the river is developed, they split copulations in two, and then we had this divergence between um, individuals or individual species on either side. Um, in contrary, our reconstruction suggests that no um, the, no cladogenetic events in the Pleistocene were characterized by vicarian. So this does not seem to be um, a biogeographic process that is influencing um, the great diversity we found among TT monkeys. So rather than vicarians owing to landscape change, our results support a long distance dispersal model by island hopping across river barriers or dispersal around the headwaters. So we found these jump dispersal events are obviously infrequent enough such that um, that allow divergence and isolation after dispersal, which points to Amazonian rivers as quite strong barriers. Um, but um, So they form significant but not completely impenetrable barriers to the spread of TTs, limiting gene flow and promoting genetic isolation after a rare dispersal event. Overall, however, we suggest that TT monkey diversity is best explained by lineage-specific dispersal ability, which is limited by riverine and other ecological barriers to varying degrees in each taxa. If it was purely, um, if it was purely that the rivers, if the, if the focus was purely on the landscape, then maybe we'd see similar amount of tax of numbers of species in each each genus, which we don't. Um, so habitat preferences and the greater dispersal uh, ability of the Moloch group likely influence the greater number of species. And we also see comparable models in, um, for birds. For example, Smith et al. summarized the principal driver of avian speciation as dispersal and differentiation on a matrix, matrix previously shaped by large-scale landscape events. Okay. So in agreement with this mode of speciation, there is evidence to, to suggest that dispersal across rivers or around headwaters is an ongoing process, albeit infrequent. And we're going to very d briefly discuss some results that I haven't published yet from one of my RADSEQ studies. Um, among the major aims of this research were to effect, address factors that led to differences in the phylogenetic signal in nuclear and mitochondrial loci. But I'm, I'm solely and very briefly going to discuss the, um, it, my investigation into a putative hybrid population of TT monkeys. Um, so evidence already existed that there might be a hybrid population. So tree specimens were collected in um, the Rondon 2 Dam near Pimenta Bueno in, in Rondonia 
Phenotypically, they resemble cinerescence, but they're not quite identical. They have some phenotypic differences. Two specimens in my I sequence all three of these in both nuclear and mitochondrial data for the 2016 study. But um, two of the specimens were formed a sister clade to other cinerascents in both nuclear and mitochondrial loci. The third specimen was a sister to cinerascents in nuclear, but formed a clade with Bernhardi and mitochondrial. I excluded it from my study because I didn't have time to redo the mitochondrial data and ensure that this wasn't some weird error on my part. Um, a few months later, a, a different study by Carnero, which redone the mitochondrial loci, um, classified this taxa as P. Bernhardi based solely on the mitochondrial data they had obtained. Um, so again, I'm not really going to go into this, but uh, for it's part of a much larger DDRAD-seq study. We have over 60 tissue samples. We're focusing solely on the P. Mollick group, which is why there's 12 species. Um, and the data sets that I used to look at introgression were had about 2,000 loci and, and nearly 600,000 base pairs. Um, the methods I employed to evaluate whether ancestral admixture had occurred primarily was the D-statistic test, which was first employed to assess introgression between human and, and Neanderthals. Um, I used both a standard four taxon and a partitioned five taxon D-statistic test. I don't have time to go into these, and they can be a little bit confusing if you're not familiar. So um, all I'll say is that D-statistic tests evaluate the occurrence of biallelic site patterns that are incongruent with the species tree. And the frequency of these discordant site patterns can be used to infer if integration has occurred and the direction of integration as well. Um, so this is just a summary. This is a mitochondrial tree. I, I redid the mitochondrial loci again to make sure that there was, wasn't something crazy going on. Um, so you see the, the other two from the clade, and this is the third individual that forms a clade with Bernhardi, and this is it in the, in the nuclear data. So was it just mitochondrial integration, or are they actually admixed species? So. Um, all our D-statistic test results consistently indicated that integration had occurred from P. Bernhardi clade A, which is a particular clade of P. P. Bernhardi I refer to as clade A, um, and uh, into, into this admix cinerascence clade. The test indicated that um, this clade of cinerascence, all, all of them, not just the individual with the mitochondrial genome, so all of them, um, is shared in a disproportionate number of derived alleles with this um, P. Bernhardi clade, um, to the exclusion of Hoffman C. Miltoni and this P. Cernarassens clade A, um, and also alleles it didn't share with any of these other, other individuals. Um, and very quickly, this is the map of collection locality. So uh, traditionally, this interfluve here is where we find Bernhardi, although we now know it also exists all along here. This interfluve here is where we find Cernarassens. Um, this is where the admixed individuals are found, and actually Cinerasens goes all the way down here, but this guy forms a clade with all these guys. Um, so the, this, this is the donor clade of P. Bernhardi, which is the admix. It's, it's the closest population we have to where it is, but we do know P. Bernhardi also exists all around here, but these guys likely form a clade together. Um, so. This, this location is outside the known distribution for Cineracins, which is actually just down to here, but we now know it goes down further. Um, overall, this scenario is, is concordant with complex diversification patterns we found in the Rondonia area of endemism, which is this whole area here in our biogeographic studies, which I didn't really discuss. But the biogeographic study suggested that the initial divergence in the entire P. Mollick group was associated with this river here, the Arapiana Roosevelt River, and that it likely was much more complex um, river dynamics within this region in the, in the Pleistocene, such that maybe these rivers actually went more sideways or they were larger. And there's evidence for megafans and other such things in this region that suggests these rivers didn't always look like this. So the hypothesis is that these rivers maybe went more over that way. And Miltoni, which lives here, Hofmanti, which lives further up here, and Cineracens, which lives here, form a clay together, and they were potentially isolated in this region. Um, river dyna fluvial dy changing flu fluvial dynamics in the Pleistocene may have allowed Cineracens to disperse down above these headwaters and then come into the area where we see it now admixing with, um, with Bernhardi. Okay, so and to finish off, I just want to talk about another usage I had for the DDRAD data. Um, so, uh, it was to aid the description of a new species of TT monkey. So um, we originally identified this lineage for the 2016 work and then spent several years collecting more um, occurrence data, more information on its phenotype. 
Um, so this is just very quickly some of the DDRAD results. Egg group, known species, Bernhardi, unknown, unrecon or no, no name species, and then BRI and Mollick. And these are um, Bayesian clustering analyses that I done um, using structure, which, which shows quite, so the, the actual supported one was K equals five, which shows Bernhardi, um, our new species, funnily enough, they look the same color, but they're not, um, Mollick and two, and then, and then VRI. Um, a morphological comparison um, confirmed that it had a unique uh, combination of characters. So the main differentiating features were gray gooty coloration on the crown and the main body, um, an almost entirely black tail and a light yellow coloration of the hair and the cheeks, which you can see better in, a, in an image of a living specimen I'll show. It shares the red underbelly with these two, Bernhardi and Moloch, but it's actually quite a different color red, although it varies a lot within this taxa alone. So um, this is an image of the dorsal side of Moloch, which is more brownish agouti, and this is dark gray agouti of Bernhardi, and this is the Altofloresta TT. This is an image of a living specimen. They're really cute. Um, and this is where it lives in here. So this is VRI, this is Moloch and number one, but Hardy's actually over here in this region. And we named it after um, Colin Groves in honor of his, work, his dedicated work towards neotropical primatology. He worked on us with in the 2016 paper as well. So Pector Cebus Grovesi is its official name and its common name is Groves TT or the Atlantic Forest TT. Um, Perhaps scaringly, we did we had a look at it. Um, it's uh, predicted uh, its region. It occurs in the arc of deforestation in the Amazon, um, some of the most deforested regions. And um, it, using satellite imagery and predictive models, we showed that it already lost 42% of its habitat. And within t three TT generations, that is by 2042, it will have lost maybe 86% if things keep going as they they are now. Um, based on this finding, we suggested that it should be considered critically endangered under the IUCN criteria, i.e. that um, population reduction projected, inferred, or suspected to be met in the future of a greater than 80% decline in extent of occurrence. Um, okay, so just to finish up, within a few years, our knowledge of the evolutionary relationships among Cali 7A taxa progressed rapidly and perhaps in a manner that was relatively unprecedented among um, neotropical primates from Species relationships based almost entirely upon Kobayashi's 1995 morphological phylogeny in 2015, to complex phylogenetic hypothesis divided from multilocus or genome-wide genome -wide RAD-seq molecular data sets among the largest known for any neotropical primate. Um, so molecular evidence is aided in the delineation of new genera and new species, as well as a species that I, I suggested we should get rid of that I didn't really talk about much. Um, and increase our understanding of the factors driving diversification. There really is still so much to learn on all aspects of the biology. It's hard to emphasize that enough, but I consider this larger work a career-long project um, that will hopefully never end once I'm in academia. Um, I hope that so you've learned something that interests you guys about these amazing primates, and thank you so much for listening to me ramble for an hour about these guys. <laughs> I'm going to get my glasses, actually, because I can't see it properly. <laughs> but I also don't wear them very much, so they're kind of disorientating. So I can actually see if people have questions. Yeah, of course, go ahead. Uh, great talk. It's so much information. Around. Yeah, sorry. I'm <laughs>
I think right now there's so many unknowns. Like it's hard, we don't even know when the rivers kind of came fully in the Amazon, and you know we're kind of like basing this on it. It doesn't change too much. The only difference for our results in the model is when the Peva system disappeared. But um, it, there's there's we know so little about even them now and fully the areas they exist in now and the 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 factors, the pressures they're under now that you know might be. You know, but I find it very interesting that they has continued. That and and I one of the things, huge things I'm interested in is looking into their genomes and seeing if there's any huge signatures there or why they all exploit social monogamy and why they all still exploit social monogamy. And you know, can we find some interesting genetic signatures? But yeah, it would be really interesting to look because there is there is um there's other neotropical primates that show some degree of of social monogamy and some of the marmosets and things like that. Although it's it's quite different to I think so. it's, it's a little more variable than we know in TTs, but having said that, we do also, we, they're so understudied, there's never even been a study to look at genetic monogamy in TTs. We don't know if they're genetically monogamous or not. It's just that we just assume they are. I know that there is someone doing this research in the, in the German Primate Research Center, actually, I think, right now. But, um, yeah, it's very, it, we're very far away from, I don't, yeah, I just don't know if they're the group that we need to look at trying to figure out these underlying factors in when we know so little about them, too. But yeah. Yeah. So, um, tons of information. <clears throat> and um, this is also pretty far from my own area. So, mm -hmm. forgive me if I either it's just a naive question or I missed something. But uh, it, what strikes me as a kind of major unresolved question here is what is driving the, the petition. So, on the one hand, the petition seems, at least some of it seems to happen on relatively short time scales. Ruled out by variants as an explanation in many of the cases. There's underlying skeletal, skeletal conservation, and to the extent that social monogamy is, you know, characteristic, there's conservation of that as well, right? So, so if on the one hand, I mean, you're you're somewhat flip, um, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Explanation of conservation here is it's reasonable, but by the same token, where does the diversification come from, right? I mean, if it's, if it's not drift, because it's not, you know, if it's not geographical separation, um, then what's driving it? Why do well, we I, I do it? think it's geographical separation. I think that they came from quite a narrow area, and they started to spread out, and then they're, they're geographically restricted from each other by these major rivers, although they can cross them. It's a relatively rare event, so we have this essentially over time they, they're changing, and they're changing in different ways um, based on probably the environment and certain other things. But I do think a large, a large amount of this is, is simply that they're divided by these rivers, and this provides this isolated kind of matrix within which they're, they're diversifying, they're getting different. We see that. So the two, the hybridized species that I, the, or the hybridized population that I potentially found, they... They are in the Moloch group. They're part of the most distinct clades of the Moloch group. So it's likely that all these species can interbreed if they actually came back together again. So they're they're uh, not very unlikely to be genetically, um, uh, you know, isolated. If they came back together, they could produce very likely produce a fertile offspring. And I believe that within the P Moloch group, it's probably the case for all species, and and likely the other within each genus, they can probably all interbreed together. So they're um, they're. They're, yeah, they're div dividing, but I, I feel like it's a it's a, a yeah a landscape matrix that has allowed them to move into this area, diversify within there. But, you know, and their pelage will change, and there will be this kind of drift essentially. I do believe that it, that is a lot of it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, some it does. Yeah. I, I'm still a little bit puzzled because given the striking variation in pelage, which I mean, yeah, almost being equal, we would think that these were you know that there were that. There was sexual selection operating there. The sexual well, they have some very interesting things. Like their their polymorphic color vision uh, system. Do you know of this system in primates? So they um, uh, all males are are uh, are red green colorblind. Females can be red green colorblind, but it depends. So they have uh, they have two opsin alleles. They opsin out. They have an opsin gene on the X chromosome, and they um, use both alleles. The females use both alleles, and they they don't actually have three opsin genes like all world primates do. So they only females can have 
uh, full color vision, trichromatic color vision like we do. And then there's certain selection and certain, um, there seems to be selective pressures on it. And the few studies that exist on TT suggest TTs have the most, or among the most amount of different alleles, which would make it more likely if these are in equal frequency, which is another question, which would make it more likely that the females have trichromatic color vision. It's more likely they're going to inherit these different alleles, they need to inherit a different allele from their parents, each parent, to have this trichromatic color vision. So um, the more alleles it is, the more likely they'll inherit trichromatic color vision, and um, in which case, the more likely they can see, they can differentiate red-green. And you see most of them have these red and orangish colors on them. So there's a very interesting story in there somewhere, as far as I'm concerned, but I just don't know what it is yet, and I don't think most of us do. But I do think there can be other things in there, too, with, with this, uh, this kind of system. But I also feel there's probably... Um, there's probably some genetic factors that allow them to switch between these colors very easily. Like it's a small number of base pair changes that is controlling this, and some of it is quite is quite random because you see the you see reappearance of traits in things that are in sister species, and you know this band that appears all over all over the Moloch group, and it doesn't appear in they're not sister species that show this this white band on the head. So they have obviously certain um, genetic controls and expression controls of these color these color systems that that we don't understand at all. But I think that that's part of it too. It's probably very simple, small genetic changes that could be in, in drift as well. And they're they're not um they're also like most species show quite a lot of variation in their color. Like some of them are so variable, it's hard to it's hard to actually sometimes assign individuals to species based solely on color without without the genetics. Which is interesting Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So certain areas, it's just it just kind of gets really random, and you know it gets complicated when you look at tax, certain taxonomic reviews that describe species and don't talk about the variation in them, and they talk about these diagnostic characters like they're super fixed when they, and then it's incredibly confusing when you go back and try to read about these things. But yeah, it seems like it's, it is quite a bit of drift and whatever. Density dependence, and so because if there's drift, but you, if I'm re recollecting, there there are some species who like there was a, a fair amount of variation in the types of environments the different species were able to live in. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So a sort of simple density dependent, if they're all equally, assuming the genetic results show they all are equally socially monogamous, do you imagine that density dependence wouldn't be the same across all those different? But then you talked about them all living high up in the treetops and things like that. So I'm just I'm wondering what is known about the variation in either in um, the density of of pairs across the landscape mm -hmm. or um, and how much you know about whether those things vary. I, I as far as I'm concerned, I don't know of anything. Do you, Jessica, know of anything? I mean, there would there would be like specific studies, but extremely patchy information. Mm -hmm. They they live in different areas. So like even the Moloch group guys, they tend to they can be they can be not they can kind of come down lower, but it's in like very dense habitats with liana rich kind of habitats and often living at the edge. The Carasibus guys they tend to live more higher up in the canopy. Um, but again, these are really there's really so it's it kind of hard to emphasize how little we know of them and how few studies there are done and how much we're assuming that this information applies more broadly than it does. And, you know, even some of like the Donacophilus group, all, all of these guys are so little done on any of them, any of them at all. Um, and there's some evidence, there's some existing evidence that there's been groups of up to seven adults in a group. And, you know, these things that are just like observational evidence, and we've just really no idea there's very little like concrete scientific studies done that we can go on that. So I wouldn't be surprised if we're finding other systems or, you know, some of them have moved away from social monogamy to some degree or um, it gets more complicated or if areas across groups or across landscapes, as you said, because the Donacophilus guys live in the most different landscapes. They live in these forest, gallery forests in, in savannas and in quite open habitats that are just patches of forest. So and, and they're the guys that seem to have, like, often have more in them. But again, it's not something that's really known. It's hard to, it's like, we need lots of field biologists to go and do all these things. And you need multiple. I mean, because you could make some simple predictions, right? Like if you knew something about the density and you knew and you had enough samples from each species, mm -hmm. you could make some predictions about the rate of density across the species based on some of these habitats. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But you, it sounds like you also only have one or two samples. 
for a species? Is that... I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, you mean in terms of generation? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it depends, yeah. It depends on which, which, which individual is. But yeah, and see, the things with, with, with TTs is it's quite, it, you, you know, you either habituate them and you take some form of hair or fecal samples, which will take quite a long time, especially given their behaviors, or, um, or, or you, you shoot them, you know, and take, you know, you kill one to take their, their, their tissue samples. So you can only do this at a very small, you know, and I, I have very conflicting views about this. This is stuff that was done outside of my research, but uh, where most of our samples are from this, they're, they're from an animal that has been, you know, taken to, to get this tissue sample. So. Or zoo samples. Zoo samples, but we only have, outside of rain countries, the only, there's only two species in zoos as far as I know. So we have, we have cuprius, which are the models that are used in the primate research center in UC Davis. And then we've done acophilus in some American zoos as well. And I'm pretty sure they're the only species that exist outside of uh, the range countries. Um, so it's very, it's very difficult to really study them. They're not that attractive zoo animals. Even though I see them in zoos and they're just like sit there and they're a little pair and they don't care about, you know what I mean? They, you never see people around them looking at them or you're really engaged by them or whatever. So. In the issue of reconstructing the genetic mating system, which, you know, as you said, there's so little known that um, it might be interesting to target some species for being more likely to have non monogamous mm -hmm. mating ancestry. And so I imagine you could do something like looking at uh, uh, the time of coalescence of Y chromosome versus X chromosome. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason why you didn't? I tried to, so I actually tried to amplify some primers from the Y chromosome for the study that we'd done, but they all failed. So all the ones, the few ones that were in Perlman's study didn't work. So we did, uh, there's uh, uh, the 20 nuclear loci I chose from Perlman, I tested the 56 and I chose the 20 that actually worked the best. But unfortunately, the Y chromosome ones either all failed or obviously failed in half the samples because half of them are, are female or, and even if they did, they didn't seem to work. I do have some data for Y chromosome, but I'm not sure whether it's, it's usable and it didn't go into to that study. I think I have one or two loci that I sequenced for a few individuals and it didn't seem to work out very well, but um, yeah, it was it was quite difficult. But it, you could design primers and these things, but maybe we don't have any, um, there's no genome for anything closely related to TTs either, so this stuff kind of gets complicated. But with genomics, hopefully we'll, you know, I'm really enthusiastic about doing some genomic research with them and looking into, there's so many questions that could be answered and they, you know, with using that. So, and then hopefully we'll get some data and we can start looking into things like that. Yeah? Um, I, so I don't know, I think you might have answered or at least answered adjacent uh, this question when, when um, you were uh, answering Dan's question. So if it is redundant, please, <laughs> but I was really interested in the, the distribution, the, in the sort of striking collage differences mm -hmm. um, between species. And I just wanted to know if there were any, um, I don't know, clear patterns or the absence of clear patterns that was notable in thinking about the geographic distribution, um, you know, particularly this, this impact of the uh, impact of species. Yeah, well, there's, there's some, actually, probably we know more from other primates that we can... Um, we can infer, but in in other groups that live in more open habitats, you get these paler you get these paler colors. And and let's go down to so Donicophilus here is 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 kind of so actually all these guys that kind of go more buffy colored live in don't live in the Amazon. They live in outside the Amazon in different kind of habitats. The guys down the corner they live in the Atlantic forest and they have quite a different kind of coloration. And then. Um, the Donicophilus group up here, they, they live in quite open habitats. So let me just go. So the palest of all TTs, there's, there's two. Uh, Barbara Brownie, um, which lives in Kachinga, which gets really pale. And it's, there's an association where we go to more open habitats. So we get these blonde colored primates, essentially. And we see it in capuchins, and we see it in, in a lot of neotropical primates. So there's an association between overall pelage coloration and the, the type of environment they, they occupy. Um, and then also in, in palisands. Palisands goes into the Shaco and these kind of open habitats. And this is also the other pale one. And they're from two different groups. That's Calisibus genus. That's the Plectorosibus to Donicophilus group. So we're seeing like association between pelage coloration and type of environment beyond um, 
beyond maybe uh, through his genetic controls too, obviously, but it, there seems to be a link between those things. Um, and then the guys that have the band, so we have Discolor here, and we have Dubious with a band, and we have Ornatus, and they live quite near to a species that is part of a different, like they're still closely related, but they're part of a different part of that group. They're not sister species, and there is kind of like underlying hypotheses in some literature that that could be a, 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 um, a species recognition kind of thing. So these guys... Stephen Nashi, Kelly Gattis, and Dubious, these guys here, are super, I think they're all the same thing, actually, but they, um, Dubious lives in the south of the interfluve, where it mixes in with Cuprius here, and Topini, which isn't on this chart, um, and it seems like this, this band could be, so it doesn't interbreed with Cuprius and Topini, but, you know, these guys seem to actually intermix up the north, so there's, there's various, but we, we again, and this isn't actually anything now, this is kind of conjecture and, and whatever, um, but I know someone right now is studying the bands in these guys and trying to come up with a reason why they... I don't know what their conclusion was, but I've been waiting for their studies to come out for a little while. That's Jan Vermeer to see if he has any solution to these kind of things. Does that kind of answer your question, or did I go off somewhere else? <laughs> okay. um, can, I, can I follow up? Yeah, of course, yeah. An unrelated question, but just thinking about what you were saying about the, um, the differing boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just a very... I don't work with any yeah, of no. data. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about where um, kind of where your understanding of the um, the sort of ancient geography comes from. Is it like there are known models? Is this work that archaeologists are doing? Are you probably with geologists? Oh yeah. Like, how do you know where those rivers were to be created? Oh yeah. I was well, really surprised with it. The sort of when you had the four. Yeah. So we're, it, this is very assumptive. So, so it's very likely that some of the rivers have moved, and we just don't necessarily know. Let's go down here. So there, there's, uh, there's, um, let's go. Where are we? Rivers, rivers. So this is just to try understand. I mean, it, it, there's evidence that, like for example, that this river here, which is the Rio Negro, that that there's some change. There's something funny that went on here in particular. There's some guys that are on this side of the river. Or maybe it's, it's over here. Yeah, the guys that went in South Carbiel, the Cachoeira in this region. There's evidence that these guys maybe were the other side of the river at one point in time. And there's, there's kind of like weird things that have happened in here. There's a, a population of Caracibus, the black, uh, black pelage guys that occur in here that have red bellies just like they look really just like the guys in this part of the river and did they move or how did they, where did they get we don't know who they are or what we don't know genetic data for them yet it's part of another thing that I'm kind of investigating um so some of this is is quite assumptive that the rivers haven't changed all that much to what we're doing now but a lot of the we do also all, all of this information has been influenced by uh, studies of the change in landscape. So I'd read so many papers about Amazonian, the evolution of the Amazonian landscape of the basin and trying to understand all of this stuff. So, and that's part of where the hypothesis that I had that came about that um, these guys used to be closed off over here, the, 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 which is just down here, I can do it actually up here. They, um, so actually in here. So this is when, this is the original split and there's, there's like a, a lot of Geological work done in here suggests that there's major, major alluvial fans in this region, and there's a lot of there's a really complex drainage system that we don't see right now. And there's even hypotheses that some of these rivers went more, more to this side and so on that um, uh, would explain some of our diver diversification patterns. So it's very likely some of these rivers are quite different, but the major beds that they're on seem they can like date them. And I think mo the general consensus is that when the the basin or the drainage system rose, it's been pretty similar since then. Um, I also should say that these some of these rivers in the Western Amazon are white water. Um, they, they, they're they around white water forests and they, they're white water rivers. They they change location frequently. So there's, there's definitely been, so some of that could have changed. But the interesting thing I didn't mention there's a type of forest, so there's various types of forests in the Western Amazon. There's terra firm, which are non-flooded forests. There's igapo, which are seasonally inundated blackwater forests, which on both of these you find titis in. But the whitewater flooded forests, which are really close to these west, these rivers around here, uh, called varzia, whitewater flooded forests, titis don't live in them at all. So it, 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 it's, you know, they've often been said that um, around these rivers, these are like more permeable ecological barriers. This is an old kind of hypothesis that um, from the 90s that 
these are more ecological barriers than other rivers like the ones over this side um, because of the fact they switch, they, they move around a little bit within these white water flooded forest habitats that surround them. But titis aren't found in those habitats. So it's very likely that for these rivers, they actually probably went down and, and then came back up, which is kind of what I was trying to show there. But it's hard to kind of put all this information into a, a talk or whatever. Okay, thanks.